Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and welcome to part two of Rocks, Fossils and Time. So in the previous presentation we were talking about rocks and their relationship to the uh, study of stratigraphy. So the other part of stratigraphy focuses on fossils, so now we're going to discuss fossils. So fossils and fossilization. So the acceptance that fossils represent the shells, bone, teeth of once living organisms is actually a relatively recent one. So until the acceptance of the geologic time scale, fossils had been, you know, had to be explained in the context of a 6,000 year old earth. So essentially they were explained in a biblical context. So this led to the hypothesis that fossils were put there for one of two reasons. Number one, they were put there by Crater looking to test our faith. Or number two, they were put there by Satan trying to sow the seeds of doubt. So once geologic time became accepted, the true origin of fossils became clear to many. So a fossil is defined as the remains or trace of a prehistoric organism preserved in rock. Now they're dominantly found in sedimentary rocks, although they can rarely occur in igneous rocks, primarily pyroclastic rocks, so things like mud flows or pyroclastic flows. So think of Pompeii. So if you know anything about Pompeii, you know it was a, uh, a Roman city that got hit by a pyroclastic flow. So a, a flow of ash and dust came flying down the side of, side of Mount Vesuvius and ran straight into Pompeii, covering the entire city in a layer of ash, essentially preserving everything in it, including the buildings and the people. The people were preserved essentially as voids within the ash. So essentially they were preserved as trace fossils. Now, you can also get fossils in metamorphic rocks if the protolith was sedimentary. But of course, the thing about metamorphic rocks is once you metamorphose the, the protolith too much, the fossil will be destroyed. So metamorphic rocks aren't really a host for fossils. So fossils are useful to geologists because they tell us about the environmental conditions at the time of deposition. They also tell us about the process of evolution, and they allow us to relatively date strata over large distances, so we can link rocks together, you know, which are very distal to one another. So we need to remember that relative dating is easy if you just look at a single outcrop. So, you know, if you have something with good exposure, like a canyon wall, it's quite straightforward. You know, the oldest rock will be at the bottom, the youngest rock will be at the top. You'll be able to see any cross-cutting relationships and anything, you know, unconformities, all those kind of things will be relatively clear in a vertical section. You'll be able to put them in a chronological order quite easily. However, geologists also have to commonly tie together rocks over large distances, sometimes hundreds or maybe even thousands of kilometers. So in a perfect world, what you would want is you would want some kind of uh, rock that would cover that entire distance. Now, the thing that we know from the principle of lateral continuity says that a layer of sediment will continue until it pinches out or it stops up against some kind of vertical surface, a basin margin. So the problem is, is that although some layers of sedimentary rock are quite extensive, they often don't cover hundreds or thousands of kilometers. So what you would really want is you would want something that you could, you know, something else that you could use to date, um, which was also very laterally extensive. So you might want something like a, an ash deposit from a volcanic eruption. Now, the great thing about ash deposit is, is that it's igneous in origin. So you can date it using radiometric dating. And some ash deposits can be quite large. However, once again, ash deposits don't tend to cover the kinds of distances required to allow us to uh, date rocks uh, over large distances. So when it really comes down to it, if we want to correlate rocks which are separated by large distances, the only thing we can really use are fossils. And we're going to use those fossils to produce a relative date. Because remember, most fossils don't actually have a, a numerical value associated with them. We just simply know where the fossil falls on the geologic time scale. And we'll use those fossils to link rocks together. And we can also use those fossils to date rocks based on the geologic time scale. Okay, so how do fossils form? Well, the type of fossil that we typically think about is called a body fossil and it consists of the skeletal remains of an organism. So we'll see something like the shell, the bones, or the teeth. However, body fossils can also include soft tissue that's been preserved by mummification or freezing. 
However, these fossils tend to be very recent, geologically speaking, so they, you know, they're not very old. We do, however, also count indicators of organic activity as fossils, so things like footprints, burrows, nests, feces, they're also considered fossils, but they're actually uh, called trace fossils, so they're the indicators of an organism having you know, existed in the area at that time, but it's not actually the body of the organism itself. So here we can see we have four examples of body fossils. So here we have a trilobite, here we have some gastropods, so some sea snails, here we have some brachiopods, and here we have uh, one of the intermediate phases between birds and dinosaurs. This is a very famous animal called Archaeopteryx. And you can see in all these four cases, we have the uh, whole body. So we've got the shell, the shell, the shell in this instance, and in this instance, we have the skeleton. And we also actually have the trace fossils, the traces of the feathers associated with this uh, organism as well. Now, in terms of trace fossils, here we have some examples of some burrows. And we can see the, the burrows within this muddy sediment here. We have examples like nests. So once again, this isn't, you know, this doesn't actually contain the organism itself. So we, you know, we don't have the fossil, the body of the organism. What we have is an indicator of the organism having been there. We obviously have a coprolite fossil here, essentially fossilized poo. And then we, in this case, we have uh, some trilobite tracks. So you can see this is these are the tracks left as the trilobite was moving through the sediment. So once again, these are indicators of an organism having been there. They are not the body fossil of the organism. The bodies aren't present. So the best conditions for successful preservation of a body fossil are that the organism has a durable skeleton. Essentially, the, the bigger and chunkier, the more robust the skeleton is, the more likely it will be to fossilize successfully. We, we also like it if the organism has gone and died in or was quickly transported to an environment where burial in sediment was likely and rapid. Because of course the thing is, is we want the carcass to be put into some kind of protective medium as fast as possible. So it's therefore unsurprising that marine animals with shells are extremely well represented in the fossil record. So if you think of something like an oyster, well an oyster has a very durable skeleton, an oyster shell is very, very hard. And, of course, it's living in an environment where there's lots of sedimentation going on. So when an oyster dies, the oyster shell gets incorporated into the sediment quickly. The sediment helps to protect the shell so it doesn't get damaged and lost. In contrast, something like jellyfish are terribly represented in the geologic record because they do not have a durable skeleton. They're soft-bodied organisms, so they do not fossilize well at all in most instances. So um, when we think of something, when we think of marine animals, as I was just saying, they are very well represented in the fossil record. So when it comes to the marine environment through geologic time, we have a plethora of fossils to look at. In terms of terrestrial animals, it's actually a little bit trickier because although you can have terrestrial animals that have very durable skeletons, most terrestrial environments do not have very high rates of sedimentation. So this would mean that any carcass that was uh, exposed on the surface wouldn't be buried in sediment very quickly in most cases, and so the carcass would often be damaged over time and therefore the fossil would be you know, lost. Or should I say the fossil wouldn't be able to form because the carcass had been destroyed. So if we were to think of a very extreme example of a terrestrial animal that fossilizes badly, we would be something like bats. So bats have a very thin, very weak skeleton, so obviously the skeleton isn't durable, so it's very unlikely to fossilize successfully, and they live in cave systems which have a very, very low rate of sedimentation. So once again, when a bat does die, its carcass falls to the cave floor, and it's not covered in protective sediment quickly, it's left exposed for prolonged periods of time. And obviously this means then that the carcass can essentially be exposed to physical processes, so for instance being trodden on, or it can be exposed to biological damage, so the process of decomposition or being eaten by scavengers. And so this means that bats are absolutely horribly uh, represented in the fossil record.
So you can see that what we really want to successfully fossilize something is something that has a big strong skeleton or shell and is living in an environment where there is a very high rate of sedimentation or at least the carcass is transported into an environment where there's a high rate of sedimentation. So obviously I've just said it needs to be an environment with a high rate of sedimentation we want to rapidly cover the carcass over with sediment to protect it however the question of what is rapidly obviously then springs up and there is actually no definition of what rapidly means there's no set number to it but what it essentially means is rapidly uh, is defined as the carcass skeleton or shell being covered before it has a chance to be significantly degraded by physical or chemical processes we want the body to stay as intact as it possibly can be before being fossilized so body fossils uh, are preserved in two ways remember body fossil is actually the animal itself you can have unaltered body fossils and that's where the fossil retains its original composition and structure or you can have altered body fossils where some change has taken place so um, essentially you've had an original mineral has been replaced by a new mineral with a you know, and essentially so the original fossil itself so the original fossil has been lost to some degree so unaltered body fossils have not been altered during the preservation of the organism so this doesn't mean you'll get the entire animal but it means the bit that you do get will be unaltered so it will be original or as close to original as you could possibly hope so unaltered body fossils occur in four varieties there are frozen body fossils where the carcass freezes and obviously that then inhibits decomposition so you're going to have that happening in areas which have very very cold environments you have mummification now Mummification technically means desiccation or dehydration. There's actually several ways you can mummify an organism, but in this context, what we're talking about is the drying out of the carcass. So obviously this is going to occur where you have an animal carcass in a hot environment with relatively low humidity. So desert environments would be a primary example of locations where you might expect to find mummified carcasses. The third type of unaltered body fossil are fossils which are preserved in amber. So the nice thing about amber is, number one, when it encloses the organism, it cuts it off from the atmosphere. That means no oxygen can get to the carcass. That means decomposition cannot occur. The other great thing about amber is, amber is that it is also antiseptic. And so this means it will also sterilize the exterior of the organism once again that will reduce the chance of decomposition because any of those decomposing bacteria on the on the outside of the shell will be killed off by the amber the final type of unaltered body fossil is body fossils which are preserved in tar so in the case of tar so think of the La Brea tar pit you have a situation where you have an animal that gets stuck in essentially a pond or lake of tar and the animal can't escape now most of the time these animals got or got trapped in that environment because these lakes of tar will often have a very thin film of water on top of them so it looks just like a normal lake so the animal thinks right I'm going to go and have a quick drink it walks into what it thinks is water and very quickly it realizes it's in tar it can't escape and it's trapped obviously because the animal can't escape eventually it will starve now the thing about tar is you might think that as soon as the animal dies the body is going to very quickly sink into the tar and disappear it doesn't actually uh, in a lot of cases the carcass would actually sit on the surface of the tar for a prolonged period of time maybe even several months in some cases and this would allow time for the soft tissues of the carcass to decompose so you would lose all the soft parts of the body but the bones would sink down into the tar. Once the bones are in the tar, they're protected and they cannot be altered. So later on, geologists can come along and we can literally throw a net into these tar pits and we can just pull up a whole load of bones. So the thing about frozen and mummified fossils is that they can only persist for as long as the conditions are maintained. If it gets too hot, or if it starts getting cold and wet well obviously that means your fossil is going to start being damaged very very quickly so as soon as the conditions change for frozen and mummified fossils the fossil will begin to decompose quite fast so here we have a few examples of the process so here we can see we have a mummified lizard from the Sahara Desert so you can see that it's perfectly preserved you can see the skin 
right there. So in this instance, this fossil would be complete. You would have the skeleton, the skin, the internal organs, the muscles, everything, but you know, with the exception of the fact it's being desiccated. So any part of the body that's particularly water rich, like the eyes, you can see there have been lost. So down here we actually have a relatively recent discovery. This is a uh, an Ice Age bear from Siberia. It's a little difficult to actually see what's going on, but here's the neck. So the head's up here. That's one forelimb. That's the other forelimb. And then we have a hind leg here and a hind leg over here. You'll notice, though, that if you look at this hind leg here, you can actually see where the bone has been exposed. That's because this leg was clearly above the surface, so it was exposed, it got warmed up, and the process of decomposition began, so you've lost some of the material from this leg. This is a good indicator of what happens if you change the conditions. In terms of preserved in amber, you can see here we have a, a very nice ant fossil preserved in Baltic amber in this case. And down here we have a uh, Columbia mammoth skeleton from the Brea tar pits. And you can see once again the bones here are just as if they were, you know, this it was the original skeleton. The only thing that's really different is it has this kind of slightly brownish tint to them, and that's because of the fact that it's been sitting in tar for a prolonged period of time. But the skeleton in all other senses is perfectly preserved. So Altered body fossils uh, are the result of processes which cause the fossils to change during the lithification process. So during the process of taking the sediment and turning it into the rock, something happens to the fossil which means you lose the original fossil. So altered body fossils fall into one of four categories. The first category is replacement. So in replacement what happens is the original compounds that make up your skeleton, your shell, your tooth, will be replaced by new unrelated compounds. So one of the classic examples is the mineral aragonite. So aragonite is the material that makes up things like oyster shells. And so aragonite is calcium carbonate, CaCO3. And it's very, very common during the lithification process for aragonite to be replaced by pyrite. Pyrite is iron sulfide. So you can see the original aragonite has been replaced by a new mineral which is completely unrelated to the original mineral. So the chemistry of the fossil has been changed. So we've lost the original fossil, haven't we? It's gone now. It's been so essentially what we have now is a copy of the original fossil now made out of a new mineral. In terms of recrystallization, well, recrystallization is exactly the same as replacement. The original mineral that makes up the skeleton, the shell, or the tooth breaks down and it's replaced by a new mineral. However, in this instance, the new mineral that replaces it has the same composition. So the classic example of this is, once again, here's aragonite. And aragonite is the version of calcium carbonate that's happy at low temperatures and lowish pressures. So, you know, it's a very good mineral for animals to make their shells out of. So oyster shells are made of aragonite. The thing is, though, as soon as you take that oyster shell, you put it in some sediment and you begin to lithify that sediment, the temperature and pressure begins to increase. The aragonite becomes unstable and it has to change into a new mineral which is stable at the increased pressures and temperatures. And that mineral that it changes into is calcite, which also has the chemical formula CaCO3. So in the case of recrystallization, we have changed the mineral, but we have not changed the chemical composition of the fossil. The chemical composition has remained the same. So in that respect, it's distinct from replacement, where the chemical composition does change. The third type of altered body fossil are permineralized body fossils, and this is the process by which uh, pores and cavities within shells and bones get filled by a mineral. So this is the kind of thing that tends to happen during the fossilization of things like bones. So if you've ever seen a picture of a bone at high magnification, you will know that bone is absolutely stuffed with cavities and pores inside the bone. And so what happens is, is as part of the lithification process, so as part of the rock, being turned in this part of the sediment sorry being turned into a rock there will be fluids typically passing through that rock and some of those fluids will cause minerals to be deposited inside the bone inside the pores in the bone now permineralization actually typically occurs 
along with either replacement or recrystallization. So whilst the bone is being fossilized, the minerals the bones are made of could be replaced or recrystallized, whilst the pores within the bone are being filled with new minerals. So that's permineralization. So you have you know, these processes working in tandem. The final type of altered body fossil is a carbonized body fossil. So in this instance, what we have is organic material, a body, a leaf, something like that maybe, uh, falls into an environment, it gets covered, covered in sediment, and that sediment is lithified. So as the sediment's being lithified, the temperature begins to increase, and what happens is, is your fossil is literally baked. And I'm sure you probably know if you, you know, leave something in your oven for long enough and just you know, keep baking it and baking it and baking it, well obviously what happens is, is over time all the volatiles get driven out of whatever is being heated up and eventually all you're left with is just a lump of carbon. And this is exactly the same process. So your leaf gets heated up and all the volatiles get driven off it due to the due to the increasing temperature. So you lose the water, you lose the nitrogen compounds, you lose the sulfur compounds, and it, you know, and that keeps going until all you have left is just a layer of carbon that's a few microns thick. So microns are fractions of a millimeter. So it's a very, very thin layer of carbon. But nevertheless, what you have left is a perfect carbon, uh, car carbon imprint of the original fossil. But obviously you've lost the original fossil and the composition has changed, so it has been altered. So here we have some examples of some ammonite. So here we have the original unaltered ammonite. So these ones are from uh, Russia and you can see they have this beautiful shine to them. They're made of mother of pearl, which is aragonite. So this is an example of what you know, this particular species of ammonite would have actually looked like. So this is unaltered. Now what you'll see here is here we have another ammonite where the aragonite has been replaced by this gold colored mineral. This is pyrite, this iron sulfide. So in this case the aragonite has been lost and it's been replaced by the pyrite. So this is an altered body fossil. So as you can see the chemical formula has now changed. We've gone from calcium carbonate originally and it's now changed to iron sulfide. The same thing has happened down here. Here we have another ammonite, but in this case, the original aragonite has been replaced by opal, giving it this rather beautiful opalescence. So in this case, the original uh, calcium carbonate has been replaced by silica. So in both of these instances, we have examples of uh, recrystallization, sorry, replacement. I do apologize, got myself confused there. So those are both examples of replacement. The original mineral has been lost and it's been replaced by a new mineral of a completely different composition. Down here in the bottom right, however, we have another ammonite, but in this case, the aragonite has been replaced by the mineral calcite, and this replacement has produced this rather earthy, dull looking appearance. So in this case, we have lost the original mineral, the aragonite, but we've changed it to form a new mineral of the same composition. So that's an example of recrystallization. So here we have four examples of carbonization. So each of these fossils here represents a carbonized film. So remember, it's fractions of a millimeter thick. But nevertheless, you can see absolutely amazing details. So in this case, this, this is a quite a quite a coarse fossil. You can see the shape of the leaves, you can see the stem, but the fine detail isn't hugely visible. In contrast, compare it to this leaf over here. You can see the shape of the leaf, you can see the stems, you can see some of the finer veins coming off that stem. You can even begin to make out some of the texture of the leaf as well. So this is what a really good carbonized fossil looks like. Yes, you've lost the original fossil. It's been mostly destroyed, and all you're left with is the, you know, the carbon. But nevertheless, what you can see in some cases is absolutely wonderful. So if we look down here at this dragonfly, okay, the, the body itself you know, isn't wonderfully preserved. You can see where it is. You can see the eyes there and there. But look at the, look at the wings. You've got the shape of them, and you can even pick out individual veins within the wings and, to some degree, individual little cells in the wing as well. 
and we have the same over here with this wasp fossil once again you can see the body you can see the individual segments of the body and there are the wings again you can see the veins within the wings so although carbonization does destroy the original fossil in some cases it can still produce beautiful fossils with extremely high levels of clarity which are very useful when it comes to uh, looking at rocks and analyzing the fossils the more detail the better So, so far we've had body fossils, and they come in two types, altered and unaltered, and we've also looked at trace fossils, which are indicators of an organism having been around, but you know, not the actual fossil itself, the, uh, the carcass isn't present. The final type of fossil are moulds and casts. So in the case of a mould and cast, the original fossil has been completely lost, so the fossil was present, but during the lithification process, so during the process of taking the sediment and turning it into a rock, the fossil got destroyed. So here's our situation. Here's our sediment in this kind of peachy pink color, and here's our original fossil. Now, as part of the lithification process, the fossil, in this case, got dissolved, so it got destroyed. So what we're left with is a perfect fossil-shaped void in our rock. So this is going to be our mold. Now, later on, what can happen is, is the mould can then be filled up by a new mineral, or maybe some fresh sediment can find its way into the void, and that sediment or mineral will harden, and it will take on the shape of the mould. So this is going to be the cast. So it's going to be a replica of the original fossil. It's going to look like the original fossil. It's going to have the same shape, you know, but in terms of you know the actual fossil itself, it's not the fossil. It's just something which is taking on the shape of the void left when the fossil was destroyed. Once again, though, although it's not the original fossil, sometimes molds and casts can be amazingly detailed. So even if the fossil's lost, what you end up with is still just as helpful to you as you know as if you had the original fossil there. Okay, so this table is taken from the textbook and it summarizes what we've been talking about, our four types of fossil, body fossils unaltered, body fossils altered, trace fossils, molds and casts, and it also lists the subgroup and subgroups and gives you a very brief definition of what, what each subgroup is. So another thing that we are concerned about is the degree to which our fossil has been physically broken up. So this process of physically breaking up the fossil uh, occurs after death, and typically it can be associated with a number of processes. Well, obviously, if you've got a carcass left, it's exposed, scavengers are going to come along, and they're going to start eating the soft parts of the carcass. And in the process of that, they're going to pull the carcass to pieces. So you are essentially taking your carcass and you're tearing it up. So you're going to have bones spread all over the place. This process can also happen, though, after fossilization. So imagine you have a, a beautiful dinosaur skeleton, fully articulated, so it's in one piece in your rock, but that piece of rock that the dinosaur skeleton is in becomes part of a cliff face. So as the cliff face weathers and the rock becomes weak, essentially one dinosaur bone after another will fall off the rock face as the rock face gets eroded away. And so your dinosaur skeleton will become broken up by that process as well. So it's very, very easy, unfortunately, to damage fossils. So fossils which are intact, so the bones and skeletons are in their original condition, that doesn't mean they're made from the original material. It means everything is where it should be, okay? So all the bones are in the correct location, for instance. Well, this is referred to as articulated. If your fossil has been broken up, so individual bones or fragments of shells are you know, distributed all over the place, that is referred to as disarticulated. Now, in both cases, these fossils are still useful to us. You know, a, a decent geologist can still look at a disarticulated fossil and work out what it was. But when it really comes down to it, to make everyone's life easy, an articulated fossil is always the best option because it's just the easiest one to work with. So... Here we have an example of a crinoid, also sometimes called a sea lily. So here's the stem of the crinoid, which is attached to the seafloor. This bit here is the bulb of the crinoid. This is actually where the animal itself lives. So this is where the, the, the mouth and the stomach and the reproductive organs are located. You then have these arms, 
and on these arms you can just make them out you have these very very fine feather like appendages and they catch little particles of food floating in the water they pass the particles down the length of the arms and into the mouth which is located right down here at the base so what you can see here is a beautiful example of a fully articulated crinoid. Now this is great, so as a geologist I can then go to my reference books, I can find the crinoids and I can you know, hopefully quickly identify the exact species and come up with a date for it and that will help me to date the rock in which it's contained. In this case we have an example of disarticulated crinoids. So you can see here we have these lengths of the stem, but all the other stuff, the bulb, the arms, these fine appendages, they're all gone. We haven't got them. So the fossil's been broken up. So once again, uh, now I couldn't use this to date a rock because unfortunately I'm not a paleontologist. A good paleontologist might be able to use this to actually identify the species of crinoid and date the rock, but it would be a lot more difficult than you know if you had the fully articulated fossil. So down here we have a, an ichthyosaur fossil, so this is a marine reptile from the Mesozoic, kind of like a dolphin almost. And you can see we have this fully articulated skeleton, you can see we've got the skull, the teeth, the fins, we've got the ribs, we've got the sternum, the spine, and you know all you know, the hind limbs there as well. So you can see we have the complete skeleton, and all the bones are in approximately the correct position. Compare that to this ichthyosaur fossil over here, which you can see has been disarticulated. So we have ribs, you can see here we have some vertebrae, so part of the spine, and here we have part of the, the forelimb, so this front this front uh, paddle here. So in this case, once again, it, you know, it's an ichthyosaur. A good paleontologist could be able to use these fossils and correctly identify the species and therefore date the rock. But unfortunately, you know, a geologist like me who doesn't have a, a great specialization in paleontology would struggle. On the other hand, if I had a fossil like this to work with, I could quite easily go to a reference manual, a reference book, and find the correct species of ichthyosaur, hopefully quite quickly. So although both types of fossils are helpful, so articulated and disarticulated can still be used to date rocks and correlate rocks over large distances, when it really comes down to it, articulated fossils are just easier to work with, so we prefer them. Okay, so we're going to stop part one here. So just like the previous videos, stop the video, get up, have a walk around, take a few minutes, sit down and relax, and then please come back for part two.